Okay, guys, so welcome to this final talk before lunch. Victor will be telling us about preload complexity in free and interacting quantum physics. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Robert. So let me first thank the organizers for, for putting together this nice workshop and especially Aritra for the invitation. So I will be talking about uh, a recent paper that uh, with, uh, I did in collaboration with Hugo Camargo from GIST, Mitsuhiro Nishida from Postec and Kyunyun Kim from GIST. Uh, you should also check this nice paper by Misha and collaborators, which has some overlap with our paper. Okay, so uh, let me start with some introduction. Actually, uh, Keiju already gave a very nice introduction to, to pre of complexity. So I will just review some basic stuff, um, which was not covered. But uh, yeah, so uh, recently the, the study of many body quantum chaos has gained a, a lot of attention, especially because it has connections with black hole physics. And of course, there are several approaches to diagnose quantum chaos as Arpan uh, brainstormed about it, uh, like uh, level space statistics, out of time order correlators, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. But despite some recent progress, it's not like it's super clear how these different uh, manifestations of quantum chaos are connected or if there is, for example, a unifying notion of quantum chaos. Uh, so yeah, in this work, I will discuss a new notion of, of quantum chaos known as Krylov complexity, which apparently has potential to sort of connect these different uh, manifestations of chaotic behavior. So yeah, so why study K-complexity? So K-complexity, as uh, Keiju explained, is a notion of operator growth. Um, that provides a very useful diagnosis of chaos in lattice systems. And it has connections with other notions of quantum chaos. It's easy and uh, uh, to compute and well-defined. And uh, its version for states might have some qualitative agreement with some holographic proposals of quantum complexity. Uh, so I should say there is at least two notions of Krylov complexity, one for states and another for operators. And like the complexity of operators has connections with OTOCs, complexity of states has connections with uh, other measures of quantum chaos, like level space statistics, for example. Uh, okay, so in this work, uh, we study the properties of K complexity in QFTs, free and interacting QFTs. Okay, so why study K complexity in QFTs? Like, uh, although pre love complexity has been studied for CFTs and other systems with a high degree of symmetry, it has not yet being studied for more general QFTs. And that's our basic motivation. So to go beyond the symmetry dependent scenarios, uh, we study how the Lanxious coefficients in of complexity behave when you break conformal symmetry, for instance, introducing a, a mass for your scalar field. We also study the effects of, a U, of introducing a UV cutoff. And finally, we consider uh, interacting QFTs. Okay, so I know uh, Keiju already explained the notion of K complexity, but uh, Sometimes it's a bit abstract, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain again a little bit about the, the picture of operator growth. And hopefully with this like very precise example, uh, things will be a bit more clear for people which are not familiar uh, with this area of research. So if you consider the time evolution of a Heisenberg operator, in general, you can um, write the time evolving operator in terms of a sum of nested commutators. And the basic idea of operator growth is to, to characterize how complicated this nested commutator get. So for instance, if you have like a spin chain, so Z here is like a poly matrix acting on site I, and X is also an X poly matrix. And this is like a, a Ising spin model, for example. And if you consider, for example, an operator Z1, which initially acts only on the first site, as you consider the time evolution of this operator, you will see that these nested commutators, they sort of uh, grow and become more and more uh, complicated. And the basic idea of any notion of operator growth is to characterize how, how complicated this operator gets under time evolution. So I think this is the most important slide of my presentation. So the basic idea should be clear. Do, do we have any questions so far? And of course, like, Intuitively, you know that this should tell you something about the dynamics. In a chaotic system, maybe this operator grows as quickly as possible, for example. Uh, uh, and sh this should be contrasted with the behavior of this 
uh, objects in, in, for example, free or, or integral models in which maybe this growth is not as efficient as it is in chaotic systems. And in some simple models, maybe the perturbation just moves through the system, but it doesn't really affect everybody. In a chaotic system, you can think about this as some sort of epidemic. Eventually, the operator uh, will affect all the operators in the chain. And like, of course, like as, as Keiju explained, like you, you can expand this operator in a in a sort of basis of operators, which are given, which is, this basis is given by a string of Pauli matrices. Um, and if you define some notion of inner product, you will, you will see that in general, uh, this basis is not orthogonal. So the basic idea of Krilov complexity is to create a basis of operators which is orthogonal and also normalized. So that's the basic idea in a very specific example. Uh, I'm telling you this just to complement what Keju already explained to us. So let's see how far should I go. Okay, so this is all, was already explained. It. So Keju discussed his results for uh, infinite temperature. Uh, we are going to be discussing our results at finite temperature. So our inner product is a, a bit different. We just have these factors of e, e to the beta h over two. And this is actually defined some uh, Whiteman inner product. Okay, so let me see what should I explain next. Okay, this was already explained it. So the basic idea is that the, you start with the Heisenberg equation of motion and using this uh, uh, Langsos algorithm, you end up with some sort of discretized version of Schrodinger equation. And so this is the equation you have to solve recursively. And these wave functions appearing here are basically given by overlaps of your operator with the, uh, with the operators in the Krilov basis. Uh, as Keju explained it, as you move through the Krilov chain, the operator gets get more and more uh, complex, complicated. So, the, okay, so this is the definition of Krilov complexity. And we are going to compute this for, for QFTs. This, this sort of formalism is completely general. You can apply for classical or quantum systems and QFTs. Uh, okay. Okay, so there is yet another way to, to so our goal, so be, basically we need to solve, sorry, let me go back a little bit. We need to solve this equation, right? So uh, the main ingredients that we need to compute are the Langshus coefficients, which are sort of like hopping amplitudes in this Krilov chain. So there are, uh, I, uh, there are, there, there is at least more than way to, to compute this. And what we do, uh, so yeah, so one essential ingredient in this calculation is the two-point function. We start with some two-point function, uh, which I defined it before. Sorry, I'm skipping a few slides, so maybe it's not so easy to understand. But this is the essential, the central object in the algorithm. It's like the starting point of, of everything. So we start with this two-point function. And by solving this uh, Schrodinger equation recursively, we, so we have this guy at the beginning. So solving the Schrodinger equation, we determine the, the next uh, the higher term, higher order terms in this Krilov chain. So, but to, to obtain these guys, we, we first need to compute the Langshus coefficients. Yeah, so, uh, so the, uh, to, in quantum field theory, we find convenient to compute this using uh, the, the method of moments. So basically we compute initially the so-called power spectrum, which is just the Fourier transform of your two-point function. And from this uh, power spectrum, you can compute the so-called moments, which are defined in this way. And I, I'm not going to explain how to do this, but if you have the moments, you can compute the Langshus coefficients. And in fact, uh, these quantities here uh, provide equivalent ways to, to describe the dynamics. So this will be like our starting point in QFTs because in QFTs it's easily easy to, to work in momentum space. Okay. So yeah, so let me make a few comments. Like uh, as Keju explained, uh, the basic idea uh, proposed by Parker and collaborators is that the so-called Langshus coefficient grow as quickly as possible in chaotic systems. So they basically analyzed several different uh, systems, for instance, SYK, some integrable models, some free models, and they observed this sort of pattern. 
Um, so uh, the proposal is that this should this could be useful to diagonal scales in lattice models. And one, once the if the Lanchard coefficients grow linearly, the Krilov complexity grows exponentially. There, are, there is some hidden assumptions here. Um, for instance, uh, this for this to happen, the initial two point function should go to zero at late times. But uh, in, the, in general, this is true. And you should contrast this with integrable models. For integrable models, uh, usually you get some sort of power law. But this, this was all proposed in the, in the thermodynamic limits. So you have like a very large system to work with. Uh, okay, so this is in the context of lattice models. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the maximal possible growth of Lanchard's coefficients at large n is equivalent to the slowest possible decay of the power spectrum. So basically, if you have Lanchard's coefficients growing linearly, that implies that uh, your, your, your power spectrum decays uh, ex exponentially in this way. So I don't want to discuss this very much, but uh, uh, yeah, so this has some interesting connections with OTLCs. For instance, uh, for infinite temperature, Parker and all derived uh, this, this bound, which basically tells you if the system um, has some sort of Lyapunov exponent, you can show that the rate of growth of Krilov complexity bounds the Lyapunov exponent. So alpha here is basically defined by this relation. So two times alpha bounds the, the Lyapunov exponent. And of course, the, the Lyapunov exponent appearing in this relation is the, the so-called quantum Lyapunov exponent that characterizes the, the behavior of OTOCs. Uh, I should say this is in general uh, different from the classical Lyapunov exponent. In some situations, the, you have a quantum uh, classical Lyapunov exponent, but the classical one is not even uh, well-defined. And this sort of exponential growth happens in sort of a very specific situations like at large n or if you're in some sort of semi-classical limit. And there's also evidence that the bound remains valid at finite temperature. Um, and I think this is like the main reason people got interested in, in Krilov complexity because you can make a statement about the Lyapunov exponent. Yeah. So let me now, yeah, so I should comment a little bit about results at, uh, uh, away from the thermodynamic limit. Uh, so if you're away from the thermodynamic limit, uh, if, you, if your system has a finite number of degrees of freedom, the Lanczos algorithm stops when n equals k, where k is the dimension of Krilov space. And one can show that the dimension of Krilov space uh, has this relation with the, dynamic, uh, with the dimension of the Hilbert space. And in this case, what you observe is that initially the, the Lanczos coefficients uh, grow linearly. Um, and this should, uh, should correspond to a region of exponential growth. But however, uh, uh, if you have a finite number of degrees of freedom, the, the Lanczos coefficient will saturate to a constant value. And this automatically gives you some linear growth of Krilov complexity, regardless of the dynamics. Anyways, like, uh, so this is a different feature. Like if you have a system with finite number of degrees of freedom, usually we will, you will observe a linear growth of, of Krilov complexity in some sort of time window. And eventually the Krilov complexity will saturate and the saturation value of the Krilov complexity will tell you something about the dynamics. Basically in chaotic systems, chaotic systems, the Krilov basis is uh, populated completely. Uh, and in, in integral models, uh, it's not completely populated. So this, so they have a different saturation values. The saturation value for chaotic systems is bigger. It's as maximal as possible in some cases. Yeah, so, yes? I have a question for the final, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Ah, uh, no, uh, yeah, so let's see. Uh, no, the, the conjecture is about the Lyapunov exponent. Uh, no, I mean, like, in, in this case, it's like, uh, for instance, think about, like, a matrix model, Phi-Thor theory, for example. 
you have some Lyapunov exponent there or some Lyapunov exponent. It's not going to be two pi over beta in this case. It's just like proportional to the coupling. But um, yeah, so uh, th this is a limitation of the, they can derive this rigorously at beta equals zero. But uh, of course, this is a bit uh, pathological depending on the example you have in mind. But there, there is evidence that this is true at finite temperature, but this is not proven. And of course, this is way more interesting. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, spacing the operators in the thermal circle, you mean? Yeah. You have. Yeah, you, you you have to do you have to do this. Yeah, that's what. Yes, I think it I think it does, and uh, we have to consider the uh, Whiteman inner product, where you separate you move this to the opposing point on the thermal circle, like uh, have to move this operator on the thermal circle. If you... Uh, yeah, I mean like uh, uh, things get you define it depending on how you define uh, this Whiteman. For the Whiteman function, everything is well-defined. There might be some other options in which is well-defined, but if you try some naive option without the beta, it doesn't really work. I mean, like you get some nonsensical results. Uh, yeah. Yo, thank you for, for this question. Uh, yeah, so where was I? Yeah, okay. I was discussing. Uh, yeah, so basically th that's the statement that I want to discuss. Like uh, uh, the statement is that linear growth of Lanthus coefficient lead to exponential growth of Krilov complexity. So let's see how this, uh, this is supposed to take place only in chaotic systems, okay? Integrable systems, you expect to observe some sort of power law behavior for K complexity. Uh, okay, so let's discuss now what happens in, in QFTs. So what happens in QFTs, it's, it's a bit uh, disappointing actually, because uh, you, we start, uh, with this two-point function, right? However, if uh, this two-point function is analytic in this strip, and if I take time equals to i beta over two, I will be placing the two operators on the same point. And in QFTs, this usually leads to some sort of divergence, right? Which you don't have in lattice models in general. So, so this, fun this function has a singularity at this specific value of imaginary time. And this immediately implies that the power spectrum decays exponentially. However, if the power spectrum decays exponentially, this also implies that the Lanthus coefficient grow linearly. And if they grow linearly, you get exponential result for, for the K complexity. And, but this happens for any CFD. So it, regardless of the dynamics. And in fact, this was first shown by, by, by Misha and, and Dimarski um, some, a couple of, of years ago. Uh, they basically work in two-dimensional CFDs, and they found this universal result, like which uh, you get this result regardless of the type of CFD. So you get a linear growth of Lanthus coefficient and exponential growth of complexity for holographic CFDs or for rational CFDs, like for chaotic and non-chaotic ones. So this is CFD. CFD. Where is CFD? I know. Sorry. Uh, the, the first result was for for CFDs. Um, but the general expectation is for any QFT. QFT yeah. QFT. Leads to exponential growth. Yeah. So this is, of course, is a little bit disappointing because you cannot really use this to diagnose chaos in QFTs, uh, which is different, for example, from OTOCs. OTOCs work in some vector models in QFT. Uh, but uh, a critical of complexity really doesn't. How, so it, it, apparently it says nothing about chaos but I will be able to make a statement about chaos uh, in the end. Um, so yeah, so the so what we did here, like we, we, yes. Sorry. Sorry. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh, know you mean like this this yeah, factor here. Not, yeah, yeah, it changes, it changes. Yeah, I mean like it. Uh, it doesn't work for any choice. I would say it doesn't work for any choice. But yeah, so what I do, I do for for deriving this. Like I mean, like this one leads to like well-defined stuff. So maybe. So what do you mean to say that? I mean, like you can compute. Uh, Langlois coefficient, everything like for, for instance, the problem is uh, you might have some pathologies in the in your spectral uh, power, for example. The Fourier transforming maybe it's not like well defined or something like that. Yeah, so okay, so what we did in our work was to consider uh, basically this type of CFD, like the simplest example. Um, so basically, you want to study the effects of mass, ultraviolet cutoff, and interactions in, in the Krilov complexity. See if this changes the picture in an interesting way. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So for interactions, we did specifically for dimensions. Yeah, because it was a bit uh, for some technical reasons that I will explain in a moment. Uh, so let me first discuss the effects of a mass. Okay which is easier to, to discuss. So yeah, so the, what's the basic idea? Like we are going to first compute the Fourier transform of our, our two-point function in, uh, in, in QFTs. Once we have this result, we can compute the two-point function uh, in, as a function of time, which gives us the starting point of, of the Langsos algorithm. And from this, uh, Function, we can also compute the moments. And from the moments, there is a, a recipe to, to compute the Langshaw's coefficients. So, and then we just solve this uh, Schrodinger equation recursively, obtaining all the phi's. And finally, we compute uh, the Krilov complexity. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, our starting point is, is defined by, by this two point function here. We are going to place all the this x. We are going to consider x equals zero, actually. Um, so yeah, so the Whiteman function is related to the spectral density, and the spectral density is basically given by by this expression involving uh, a commutator. And it turns out in free theory, uh, the spectral density takes a very simple form in terms <laughs> of uh, uh, Dirac delta functions. So that basically allows us to compute. Uh, the, the Whiteman function. And so in the end of the day, we compute our spectral power and we get some simple analytic result. That's a, in part our motivation to consider a scalar field because we have some degree of analytic control and we can uh, uh, understand better what's going on. So basically what we see here, uh, if I set the mass to zero, I will, I will get basically the CFT result. But what the mass does, like you see, there is a theta term here. So the mass basically uh, acts as an infrared cutoff. Mm -hmm. And this mass has some interesting effects on the Lantros mm -hmm. coefficients. And from here, we can also compute the autocorrelation. It takes this form. These function Cs are, are given by ratio of polynomials. They're a bit messy, so I decided not to show them here. Uh, yeah, so let's move forward. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so for, for some technical. I know, yeah, so later, yeah, this is, I'm just analyzing the effect of mass here. So for simplicity, uh, it's actually easier to handle these formulas and compute the moments if it is odd. And so we compute for D equals five, seven, nine. But. No, it's, it's excluded in this section, but uh, D equals four is just, uh, oh, sorry. D equals four is just here. Here is like the uh, five, seven, and nine. But the lessons are sort of general. It's just for technical convenience. Sorry about my confusion. Uh, yeah, so basically what we observe is that the main effect of mass is to divide uh, the Langshaw's coefficients into two families. 
one for uh, even values of n and other for odd values of n. And the separation between the two families is, is basically given by the mass. Um, yeah, so we were able to, to find some analytic formulas for, for the first um, Langstroth coefficients, but I, I don't have much time to discuss that. Uh, yeah, so what, what, okay, so if I have this staggering effect, the separation between uh, two sets of Langstroth coefficients, this has an interesting effect on the Krilov complexity. So th this is a plot of Krilov complexity, it's a log plot. And you can see that there is this uh, sort of like linear behavior, which implies some sort of exponential behavior for, for the Krilov complexity, which we study in some particular time window. Uh, and I also plot here the results for a CFT hyperbolic space, just for comparison. And what we can see is that the mass introduced some oscillations at uh, early times, but eventually the result becomes like a sort of like a line. And we have this sort of exponential behavior. So basically what we want to study, we want to extract this uh, exponent because this exponent is uh, it's what bounds the Lyapunov exponent when it exists. So let's do it. Uh, yeah, so basically this is a plot of how this exponent, the Krilov exponent depends on the mass. And basically we observe that yeah, so I should say for, for CFTs, what uh, was previously a bit disappointing is the fact that this exponent is always to pi t, like which is like the maximal, if you say this is like a Lyapunov exponent, this would be like the maximal Lyapunov exponent. But of course it isn't because uh, you get this behavior for any QFT. So this is just like some, some, some number, but you always get to pi t in QFTs. Um, but what we get, what we got here is uh, a bit more interesting once you introduce mass, because initially you get to pi t, but as you increase the mass, the, this, this coefficient uh, decreases. And we sort of fit some function to this, to this behavior. So you can see that, of course, this is like a very simple uh, scalar field, but for more uh, sophisticated systems, this might be interesting because this quantity bounds the Lyapunov exponent. No, it's not a Lyapunov exponent, like in general, like it's just some, it's just a Krilov exponent. Yeah. Yeah, the, the CFT case, it's a, a, like a very strong counterexample, I'd say. Uh, yeah, so this is like, basically when I had these two uh, sets of Langstroth coefficients, and we can like adjust the line to, to each set. And you can see that the parameter alpha for both cases, it's pretty close to pi, which is like the, the result you would get for zero mass, for example. And just this uh, constant term, the difference between the two constant terms that gives you the, the mass. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, so this is basically is the effect of mass. We also study the effects of including a UV cutoff. Uh, by including a UV cutoff, we wanted to simulate like putting the theory on a lattice or something like that. So basically we introduce a maximum momentum here. And we also have some degree of uh, analytic control in this case. And this has a very simple effect. Uh, if you have no UV cutoff, the Langstroth coefficients just grow forever. But if you put a UV cutoff or like a maximal energy, then you get a saturation automatically. And this saturation leads to a linear growth of, uh, of K complexity. So this means that uh, in the autopolization language, the operator is not spatially coincident. Uh, sorry? I mean, it's not in the, it is spatially coincident, right? Yeah, it's spatially coincident, but not. Zero, but if you put this cutoff on the matrix that Automatically ah, yeah, you have some, some separation. Yeah, 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 that's true. Um, so yeah, th that would be like a maximal energy for us, like in the frequency. So, but you can see, for example, even like for, for the billiard systems that Keijo discussed, like if you introduce a maximal energy, then automatically you get some saturation, for example. That, that would be an example of, uh, of what this lambda represents, for example. You're just truncating the spectrum, basically putting the theory on a lattice. Uh, uh, what we observe is that the saturation value here depends on the, on, the, on the UV cutoff in particular. 
And once you do this, the initial exponential behavior just becomes some sort of linear behavior automatically. So this linear, so of course the, the, there is a region of linear growth we should correspond to a region of exponential growth, but this is just too small, you cannot see here. So you just see the, the linear behavior. So whenever you have a system with a finite number of degrees of freedom, you should you always observe this sort of like linear behavior until it saturates. So this is kind of expected, and this is similar to, to the behavior observed in the free lattice models, and for instance, in this paper by Misha and, and collaborators. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, the effect of the UV cutoff. Effect of interactions, this is actually a bit more interesting. For interactions, we actually fix D equals four. And we consider two types of interactions like this L equals three, which is like a relevant deformation and L equals four, which is a marginal uh, deformation. So the basic idea is that we compute the one loop self energy and we use analytic continuation to, deter to determine the, the one loop correction to the power spectrum. This is what we, we did. So let's just start with the simplest case, which is the 5-4 theory. For the 5-4 theory, uh, we are basically considering a, a self-interaction of this type. And this is actually, this, this calculation is very simple. It's like a textbook calculation can be done and you find some constant result. And by in summing all particle, one particle irreducible diagrams, you can actually see that the propagator changes from this to this. But since this is a constant, the, the main effect of these interactions in this particular case is just a shift in the mass. You change the mass, you get some thermal mass. So in, uh, this is a sort of like a trivial effect, but it has some interesting consequences. Because as I told you before, uh, the mass affects the Krylov exponent and the Krylov exponent uh, bounds the Lyapunov exponent. So that means uh, under the presence of interactions, you can actually define a sharper bound on Ks. Uh, okay, so as for the effects of 5-3 uh, theory, 5-3 theory, theory, you have to consider this type of diagram. So this is a bit more, more complicated, uh, uh, but we, we found this formula for, for, for the first, let's say one loop corrections to the spectral, to the power spectrum. And uh, this is a bit uh, complicated. So we had to do this numerically. Um, and for this last expression, we actually set the mass equal to zero. And let me discuss the effect. The effect, since this is a perturbative effect, it's very hard to see the numerical data. So I'm just gonna show you a cartoon of the effects. So basically, and in the case of cubic interactions, we also observe some staggering effect, but it's a staggering effect that decreases as you increase N. So asymptotically, this, there is no staggering, but at the beginning, there is some decreasing. Sorry, I'm just showing you some cartoon because my, my numerical data is not super clear, not so easy to see. Uh, so yeah, the, the staggering effect that decreases with N is known to be associated with systems in which the power spectrum has bounded support. That means uh, the system has some sort of UV cutoff and no mass gap, as it is the case in this particular example. So yeah, so just to summarize, for the 5-4 theory, you observe constant staggering, and the 5-3 theory, you observe like this decreasing staggering. Um, and like uh, the, the properties of staggering can be traced back to the properties of the power spectrum. Uh, basically, if there is a mass gap, you get constant staggering and you get a decreasing staggering if there is no mass gap, but the function has some discontinuities if the function is not smooth enough. So those are the conditions that we sort of uh, propose uh, tentatively based on like uh, empirical evidence, let's say. Uh, the conditions for the absence of staggering, like the, this function should be finite at omega equals zero, and it should be smooth enough. So let me show you some examples. For example, uh, this is just like a, an example that we introduced by hand. The, if the power spectrum has this shape, you see there is no, no mass gap and the function is smooth. And I introduce here some UV cutoff. And in this case, I, I just observe no staggering, just some I'm just connecting the Lanczos coefficients with the line for easy visualization. Um, however, in the case we consider is actually more similar to the, the red curve here. Here we have a mass gap, the function is zero in some region. And then we have like some sort of exponential decay. 
And if you have if you have this mass gap, you observe this constant staggering. And if I artificially uh, remove this mass gap, gap and consider, for example, the blue curve, I also get staggering, but I get staggering that decreases with n. So the, the red curve would be more similar to the phi four theory. The blue curve would be more similar to the phi three theory. So I have some additional examples, which uh, I don't want to discuss, but uh, yeah. So be, the main lessons are, are that the, the mass divides the Langston's coefficients into two families and decrease the growth rate of K complexity. And in the presence of a UV cutoff, uh, the Langston's coefficient saturated a constant value and the late time growth of K complexity changed from exponential to linear. Uh, yeah, so the quark interactions produce uh, an effective thermal mass, which produces a staggering and decrease of the K. And cubic interactions produce staggering effects that reduce as we increase N. So presumably they will not affect uh, uh, the lambda K. And finally, uh, as far as I can tell, our results are, are consistent with the ones obtained by Misha and, and collaborators. Yeah, so just to, to, to have a very clear main lesson from, from this talk, uh, what have been proposed before is that if you have a linear growth of Langston's coefficients, you get the exponential growth of K complexity. And for Q of this, this was a bit boring because two alpha was always equal to two pi T, right? So what we show here is that if you introduce, for example, a mass or interactions, you get staggering. And if you get staggering, uh, the picture is kind of similar. You, all, you, all, you also get some exponential growth, but the Krilov exponent is a bit smaller. And um, so this suggests that lambda k is not always equal to, to pi over uh, to pi times t. It can be actually smaller. And this is interesting because this quantity bounds the Lyapunov exponent. So in our model, it's just a simple scalar field. We have no Lyapunov exponent well-defined, but the lesson is supposed to be general. Like, uh, so let me comment about that. So yeah, our results are for the four, four, five, four theory. Um, they, they suggest that the late time growth of K complexity decreases with G. And it would be interesting to check if this, also, this feature is also present, for example, in the matrix phi four theory, because in this case, the Lyapunov exponent is well-defined. And one could study uh, if this bound is still satisfied because this bound becomes non-trivial, becomes a tighter, bout, tighter bout, uh, bound as compared to the chaos bound. Uh, the, uh, the second point is just some speculation. Uh, we observed that for a marginal deformation, uh, there is constant staggering. Why, for a relevant deformation, the staggering decreases with n. So, since large n is usually associated with UV physics, it's perhaps expected that the relevant deformation becomes less and less important as we increase n. But anyway, anyway, anyways, like it would be interesting to investigate this further. And finally, I, I would like to point it out that studying K complexity using uh, conserved current operators instead of scalar operators might be interesting because the scrambling properties of uh, conserved currents uh, are different, and presumably this leads to a different behavior for, for Langshus coefficients and k-complexity. Uh, so I guess this is all I have to, to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Question. Oh, I didn't consider this, but like, what, what's your idea? Ah, uh, yeah, I think it's an interesting. <laughs> oh, I think this, this is an interesting suggestion. Like, can we have a look at it? Yes? Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. In that case, uh, would be that some of them are more bright. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think this is this is interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess like uh, the main thing is when you when you get this sort of exponential behavior, you 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 get this behavior by going to the continuum limit. So you and. In this case, like you cannot, you do not have like a, a, 
a smooth curve that approximates the behavior of the Langstroth coefficients. So as you break this like a smoothness condition, let's say, you don't get precisely this, but you get some correction. But I guess if you have like three branches, like this could be even more, even more interesting. And well, the results could be even more like uh, dramatic, let's say. But uh, yeah, I think this is an interesting direction to explore. I, I think the, the most interesting uh, future direction here would be to analyze um, this uh, matrix 5 4 theory because this is basically telling you that interactions decrease the, the bound, let's say. And uh, so this, this bound really becomes non trivial in this case.